Okay. So then uh, I think we should get started. Yes. Yes. Uh, would you like to uh, just briefly introduce yourself before we get into the question? Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. Good local time. Thank you. And I'm a translator working for BTC Box, which is a cryptocurrency exchange in Japan. So I will be asking your thoughts and ideas related to cryptocurrencies and blockchain today. So uh, first, I want to ask about the relationship between uh, cryptocurrency and countries or government. So uh, some of the major countries, such as China, are banning the use or transactions of cryptocurrency. And what do you think is the main purpose of those uh, major countries banning the uh, transfer and trading of cryptocurrency? Yes. Uh, well, I, I understand this is a written interview, right? It will be published uh, in text. Yes, it will be published in okay, text. So, so uh, I'm just adjusting the video, so it's a little bit more natural, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, I saw that. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's a little bit zen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I believe uh, that distributed ledger technology, on top of which cryptocurrency is built, the DLTs, uh, are fundamental in ensuring that uh, a polycentric governance around data is possible. That is to say, none of us have the entire data set to solve the problems together. And because of privacy reasons and uh, potential for abuse and so on, nobody uh, is uh, ready to share all of their data unless they understand this is a relationship of mutual trust. Now, this mutual trust uh, originally is at the purview of a state government or nationality, that is to say people who are governed in an existing way uh, are assumed to kind of trust the leader or trust a governing institution and things like that. But distributed ledger technology says, well, if you can trust the algorithm, the consensus making algorithm, then you actually can uh, also put the trust into this new form of horizontal polycentric technologies. And I believe this re uh, represents a very different model about governance as compared to the traditional more vertical models, and therefore uh, also poses a threat just as the original end-to-end -end principle in the internet uh, poses a threat to uh, censorship regimes and so on. It poses a threat to any regime that is built on the idea of monopoly of censorship and of communication. Mm -hmm. I see. So it kind of contradicts with the idea of central government where mm -hmm. with censorship and all those mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And uh, I think some countries, such as El Salvador, they are accepting uh, Bitcoin as their legal tender, right? Mm -hmm. And do you think uh, countries should actively adopt cryptocurrency, or uh, do you think that kind of depends on country? Mm -hmm. I, I believe uh, any country who want to experiment with DLTs can freely do so. They don't have to pay royalty to Satoshi. I don't know even how to pay royalty to Satoshi. <laughs> that is to say, uh, um, I mean, Bitcoin is an open source project. You can at any point fork the project to make Dogecoin or Litecoin or whatever. Uh, and so any um, um, sovereign country uh, can actually convert uh, their fiat into the centralized digital banknotes, right, uh, CDBCs. And because of this freedom and the uh, royalty-free um, um, nature of the Bitcoin-based designs, uh, I don't think it's wrong to experiment with these ideas. And then people can find out from limited risk trials uh, in which scenarios does it make more sense to use this technology, in which scenario, for example, in small amount of cash transfers, uh, cash actually provides anonymity uh, while Bitcoin provides some sort of anonymity but not yet completely anonymous like banknotes are or coins are uh, and so for people there is a trade-off but you can't find this trade-off out without actually trying it out in real life for a while. 
Uh, I see. So you think cryptocurrency are actually feasible to function as a fiat? Mm -hmm. uh, in limited circumstances, yeah, when yeah. people understand what's really going on. So in Taiwan, we have this idea of fintech sandbox, where people who agree to participate in a risk taking uh, for like 5,000 people for six months, they can find out the uh, fitness of this technology with the social uh, expectations. If it doesn't work, well, we think them for paying the tuition for everyone we all learn a little <laughs> bit uh, but if it does work then the regulators are then required to adapt yeah sure uh, since you mentioned about satoshi like uh many bitcoiners believe that even if satoshi suddenly shows up like there won't be uh, uh, any changes in bitcoin and what do you think if a person that can be fully proven that he is uh, he or she is satoshi suddenly appear and creates a new kind of a uh, new kind of currency where you think uh, that will have some influence on Bitcoin or do you think that mm -hmm. new coin will have a great impact? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know because it depends on who exactly Satoshi is. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, right. It could be that Satoshi is a group of people who can exercise uh, political power or um, scientific power or military <laughs> power in, in, in a certain way. So this hypothetical question is impossible to answer because for all we know, Satoshi is not just about owning a little bit of Bitcoin, well, a little bit of <laughs> yeah. uh, a share and my share, but is actually probably um, in addition to being a very talented designer, also having access to cutting edge technology. So mm -hmm. it means that uh, the social network in which Satoshi is uh, imbued in, the, the kind of people, the community that supported Satoshi to do this experiment is as important as that individual. Uh, mm -hmm. But without knowing who the community is, who the organization is, this uh, question is probably not possible to answer. Uh, yes, we have no idea about Satoshi, so yeah, that's fair enough. And uh, going back to Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin community is kind of supported by people who believe that the government is trying to take away people's wealth by uh, some monetary policy, for example, accelerating the in, uh, inflation. And do you think this kind of notion will spread to the general public? So do you think uh, more and more people will think that this unlimited money printing by government is kind of uh, diluting the value of their assets? Well, uh, it seems that during the pandemic, people uh, start to understand that a government printing money uh, is not the same <laughs> as like borrowing money by an individual. The macroeconomic uh, action and the microeconomic action, which share the same word, actually carries very different connotations. Uh, and this is made clear, well, after uh, the 2008 Wall Street incident, but again made apparent during the uh, counter pandemic effort by many governments. Uh, so I, I do think people will become more aware of this fact. Uh, but whether blockchain or Bitcoin is the solution, uh, that is still to be debated because, first of all, Bitcoin is not the only monetary policy in the cryptocurrency space. There are many monetary uh, policies in alternative uh, cryptocurrencies. That's the first thing. And the second is that Bitcoin is also facing uh, criticism about the energy use and the energy use, uh, which many people attributed less importance uh, back 10 years years ago uh, compared to now is again adding the externalities, the cost, uh, which is also part of the monetary policy. If you count like carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. uh, if you count it uh, and price it, then it's actually part of the monetary policy as well. Mm. Uh, I'm happy that you brought up energy because it's a very hot topic recently. So do you think the uh, impact, uh, the environmental impact of Bitcoin uh, to energy, uh, I mean, to environment is really severe, so that it's damaging the environment, so something needs to be done. Or, And do you think uh, in the future, there will be a more like environmental friendly uh, kind of blockchain uh, will emerge in the future, like something other than proof of work blockchain, maybe? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, there are already uh, ledgers based on things other than proof of work. Mm -hmm. It's just the scalability uh, and the trustworthiness um, is still being explored is an open research question, whereas proof of work is quite well understood, 
right? So, uh, I mean, we are at a phase where Bitcoin with proof of work is at a development stage, whereas the other proof systems are at a research stage. Uh, and so I think it will become more clear, uh, I think, in a couple of years, whether the transition is viable and possible or it, it, it is uh, possible, but not very viable for a long time, like IPv4 to IPv6, or that it's not even possible, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and I tend to believe it's possible, but it requires coordinated action, which may not be easy unless everyone owning Bitcoin recognize that we need to do so without sacrificing future generations. That is to say, we, we owe to future generations a better environment. If people developing and owning Bitcoin understand this as a shared value, then I think this transition will be sooner. Mm, I see. Yeah, so that kind of thing can happen. And so hopefully we will have something that is more environmental friendly mm -hmm. to solve those issues. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask about uh, the relationship between blockchain and politics. Mm -hmm. And one thing is about the uh, practice of direct democracy. So uh, do you think it is better for people to be able to uh, participate in online voting and uh, make a system that is uh, uh, able to make direct uh, democracy? Because uh, there's a movement to introduce blockchain when adopting online voting. But some people think that uh, this is not so efficient because when you, uh, it is more efficient and simple uh, and more simple if you can make a more centralized kind of system. So mm -hmm, what do you mm -hmm. think about that? Well, paper-based ballots and counting is a decentralized system. It's not a centralized system. Each individual voting booth counts independently with independent observers. In Taiwan, we even have YouTubers filming the entire counting process. It's provably local, right? Okay. <laughs> and when many local stations do so, uh, they aggregate into the final score uh, upon which like the president's choice uh, is uh, of candidates is made. Uh, and so I don't think the current paper-based system can be described as centralized. I don't think at any part of it is centralized, mm -hmm. right? So uh, other than maybe the printing of such ballots and attributing uh, it to the precincts and boroughs and so on, but there's nothing fundamentally centralized about this system. And so vis-a-vis uh, -vis the paper-based ballot, I don't think we need to build the blockchain-based systems as more decentralized. That's not the case, actually. Uh, maybe we can build it uh, as more efficient, but mm -hmm. what's at stake here is to make sure people feel more safe. And that is not easy because right. after all, not everybody is a crypto analyst mm -hmm. and not all political parties employ uh, mathematicians who can agree with each other on a regular basis in, uh, for elec electoral systems, which is why at this point, Taiwan still uses paper-based balloting when voting for people, but we use electronic, say, e-collecting uh, on the agenda setting stage and on the tallying stage we use, as I mentioned, uh, live streams or a customized app for counting and so on to make sure the auditability and accountability uh, mm -hmm. is maximized using digital technology. But the actual vote is still paper-based at this mm -hmm. moment in Taiwan. So uh, I think we can use distributed ledger technology in many parts of the process, but not necessarily in the vote casting process. Mm, I see. So uh, you use paper to vote for people. Do you have a system that uh, like uh, the nation can vote for individual policy on whether to accept it or not? Yeah, we do. Uh, and uh, we have, for example, the presidential hackathon mm -hmm. where people can vote for the most important sustainable development goal targets, more than 169, mm -hmm. well, exactly 169, but more than that number of proposals each year and prioritize five of which uh, will end up becoming like presidential promise of the year. Uh, and so during this voting, it's entirely online. It's less of a problem than voting for people because there's no exponential return, right? Mm, <laughs> if I you see. game the system, you don't get someone who will game the system for you. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not recursive. So uh, when we wor uh, work on the voting system for uh, the presidential hackathon, we use a uh, blockchain inspired voting system called quadratic voting. And we've been using that for three years now for a very good effect. And in a sense, that's agenda setting, but with higher bit rate because with quadratic voting, the preference can be expressed
in a much more nuanced way rather than just one vote, which you would probably just vote for your friends and just go, go away, right? Uh, instead of this, people will carefully uh, juggle between the synergy of the presidential hackathon ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm, I see. That's interesting. So we do have some of uh, advantages to like incorporate those kind of new technologies in our voting system. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and I want to ask some questions specifically about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so many Bitcoiners believe that the immutability of uh, is the essence essential value of Bitcoin, and they believe that the fact that Bitcoin is unchangeable is the most important. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other hand, there are more innovative new cryptocurrency that is trying to uh, renew themselves by adding new functions. So uh, in terms of your personal philosophy, uh, which do you feel more sympathy with the conservative uh, mm -hmm. kind of cryptocurrency or some innovative? As you know, I take all the sides. So I mm -hmm. think it's best if we have a full spectrum of monetary policies and of conservative and progressive experiments. The reason is that the conservative cryptocurrencies serve as the bedrock, like a safety net that proves the value of this uh, fundamental insight of blockchain technology. Whereas the experimental one can advance more progressive values, such as solving for um, climate change, right? Uh, reducing okay. carbon footprint and so on. And it may fail. I mean, many of them failed, but the fail is public because all of it is open source. So people learn that this doesn't work, that doesn't work. And after quite a few tries, maybe something did work. And mm -hmm. then the Bitcoin community will be able to benefit from this new insight, just as Bitcoin itself has benefited from multiple iterations uh, in the past, right? It's not the original Satoshis uh, anymore, but of course it con conserves the uh, almost buck for buck compatibility uh, mm -hmm. to its original values. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, a virtue in being the bedrock and there is a virtue in exploring the horizon and the best ecosystem is where many of these exist on the full spectrum. Mm, I see. So we need both. We need something that is unchangeable and we need a learning process uh, of adapting new things as That's well. Right. Mm, I see. Uh, so another thing is about scalability. And so in the blockchain community, there was the war of scalability in the past. and. Uh, there was a split between like that big block uh, section and the small mm -hmm. block sections. And even now, uh, some people uh, think that it is better to increase the block size. So what is your take on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a personal stake in this. Mm -hmm. So again, I am happy to see different explorations on different designs. In After all, what we are looking at is something brand new. Nobody know the optimal solution. Mm -hmm. We're all just uh, like swarming toward possible solutions uh, to this particular configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, if people's computing power increased by another order of magnitude, again, we'll be looking at a different configuration. If uh, broadband is a human right, as it is in Taiwan, uh, then essentially cost free uh, for each marginal uh, kilobytes transfer. That's another configuration. Mm -hmm. So uh, in every different jurisdiction, there will be naturally uh, different emerging configurations. And the beauty of open source is that even if you can't agree, you can agree to maintain your own fork, but uh, opening up the experiments uh, results and interim results to everybody else. Mm -hmm. So everybody else can still learn from your mm -hmm. hard fork, even if it comes mm -hmm. to a hard fork. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think fork is bad, actually, because I, I don't own stake in one fork or the other. <laughs> so as a researcher, as someone who's interested uh, in uh, social interaction design, the more uh, experiments there are, the better informed we are. Mm, I see. Uh, lastly, I want to ask some questions about NFTs. And uh, many people are interested in that. And so NFT, uh, uh, as we all know, is recognized as the one and only digital data. But uh, if there is a hard fork in the blockchain, then uh, there could be multiple ideas identical NFT. So do you think that NFT will continue to have value even if such issue occur? Well, to me, the NFTs are less about its monetary value than it is about its uh, kind of status value, right, as a status symbol. 
Uh, and so the status symbol, a lot of it relied on the immutable timestamp. That is to say the first to do something, right? Mm -hmm. So even if uh, that's something become very easy, even uh, free of cost uh, in the future, still the first one, uh, like the Guinness World Record, right? Mm -hmm. The first one to build a seven story sand castle. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay, but but that's mm -hmm. something like an NFT. It, it doesn't prevent anyone else from building a seven story sand castle. Uh, but right. if you read the world record book, well, you still see the name of the first one <laughs> that built a seven story sand castle, right? So what I'm trying to say is that uh, the status uh, use of NFTs differs from the investment use of the NFTs. Mm -hmm. But uh, in my knowledge and in my personal view, mm -hmm. the status use uh, dominate at this point. Mm, I, I see. So you think the value of NFT is in its status. And uh, some people think that the value of NFT, like, as you said, it lies outside of the platform. So, uh, for example, if it is an image, then uh, the value uh, lies in the JPEG data. Uh, some people say the value lies in the data itself, but some people say that uh, who owns it is imp important, so the ownership is more important. So do you think that the ownership is very valuable in case of NFT? Personally, I'm not because I'm relinquishing all my copyright, right? Mm. So if you take anything that I write and put your name on it, I wouldn't be offended. Uh, for all I know, it increased the transmissibility of our ideas. Mm. Uh, but to take such a view is fundamentally different from taking a view of copyright holder or ownership of ideas and ex expressions, patents and copyrights respectively. So I think it all depends on whether people believe in the story, uh, I wouldn't say fiction, in the story of quote unquote intellectual property. If you uh, believe in that story, then of course ownership is important and valuable mm -hmm. and NFT is one of the ways to say I transfer my copyright to you. Uh, but on the other hand, like me, if you don't believe in that story, but instead believe in the story of abundance and the story of we are just the vehicles of ideas and spreader and remixer of those ideas, then the value is in the commons, not in the individual who uh, take away from the commons, then that relationship uh, will assign less value into this kind of exclusionary NFTs. Mm, it's interesting because it's not absolute value. Like many other things, it depends on your personal belief whether it is valuable or not. That's exactly right, yes. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I covered all of the questions. Yes. So <laughs> yeah, that was great. And we will have it published in Japanese. And uh -huh. yeah, the insights were all very interesting. Thank you. And, and thank you for agreeing to, to shorten uh, this interview to uh, no, uh, no. less than 30 minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, thank you again uh, for this interview and the Japanese people uh, in particular mm -hmm. for the vaccine donations. Uh, and uh, we'll probably see each other in person when I visit Japan uh, sometimes uh, in this year. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor. So uh, please have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.